that America can't ever be neutral when it comes to Israel's America security. America will stand unapologetically to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. The U.S. funds the Israeli military to the tune of $3 billion a year. At the U.N., Israel has no stronger advocate than the United States. Those against. And when it comes to the never-ending peace process with the Palestinians, critics say Israel couldn't have a more favorable mediator. America will stand by the side of Israel every step of the way. And all the while, Israel's expansionist settlement project shatters Palestinian dreams of statehood. My guest tonight has been at the heart of US-Israel relations for decades and has been a trusted advisor to presidents and secretaries of state alike. It's been my conviction for 40 years that peace is possible. But after the latest failure, has this former negotiator now changed his tune? I'm Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with Martin Indyk, former US ambassador to Israel, who served as President Obama's special envoy on the Middle East. I'll challenge him on whether his country has acted as Israel's lawyer at the expense of the peace process, and why it is that the United States always seems to have Israel's back, no matter what. Tonight, I'll also be joined by Dr. Garda Kami, a Palestinian author and activist and research fellow at the University of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies. Rachel Sharby, an award-winning journalist and author of Not the Enemy, Israel's Jews from Arab Lands. And Professor Alan Johnson, Senior Research Fellow at BICOM, the Britain-Israel Communications and Research Centre. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Martin Indyk. Currently executive vice president at the influential Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., he also led the most recent U.S. attempt to restart peace talks in 2013. Martin Indyk, your former boss, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, has said that the United States can, quote, serve as the facilitator, the honest broker in an effort to reach a peace deal in the Middle East. But given the US supports, funds, arms, Israel, the occupying power, that's nonsense, isn't it? The United States has never been an innocent abroad, to quote the title of your book. Uh, it's never been an honest broker. Uh, well, Mehdi, first of all, thank you for having me. I, uh, I would say that the United States is pro-Israel, and that's what gives it its influence in the peace process. And that's the heart of the matter. We are not neutral. We don't claim to be neutral. We have an alliance with Israel, but in order to achieve another interest that we have, which is peace in the region, stability in the region, and, and a settlement that provides for the legitimate national rights of the Palestinians, we need to be able to influence Israel. Israel, as you say, is the and occupying power. And how has that power. worked out for you over 30 years? Well, it's worked out very well in the case of Egypt. It worked out well in the case of Jordan. And we're still working at it in the case of the Palestinians. Most people, when they look at this subject, would say, you know, if you were going through problems with your wife, God forbid, and you had to get marriage counselling, would you ask your wife's best friend to do the counselling? Sure. Because you would. My wife's You're probably best the only man friend would, would understand do. my wife, would know how to influence my wife. Absolutely. Um, seriously. Absolutely. You think that marriage counselling should be done by a party <laughs> that's biased towards one well, side? We're not dealing with marriage counselling here. We're True. Dealing... It's an analogy. It's a point that most people understand <laughs> that if you want to broker an agreement between two sides, you have to have some credibility with both sides. You can't be seen as Israel's lawyer. That is not a role that we should play. And when I was in the negotiations, now heading them up for Secretary Kerry, it was a promise that I made to the Palestinians that we would not coordinate with the Israelis and agree on the, with the Israelis in advance and try to impose it on them. But in earlier negotiations, you accept the Americans did that? There were times when we did it. I, Camp I David, for example, in 2000. The line about Israel's lawyer is from your former State Department colleague, Aaron David Miller, who advised six secretaries of state uh, on Middle East negotiations. He said at Camp David, US officials acted as Israel's attorney catering and coordinating with the Israelis at the expense of successful peace negotiations. He says both he and you brought a clear pro-Israel orientation 
to the US peace process planning. Yes, I am pro-Israel and proud of it, but I'm also pro-peace and determined that the best way to serve the, the Israel that I believe in, which is an Israel that is at peace with its neighbors, in particularly with the Palestinians, is to, to do whatever I can to help both sides achieve peace. You say both sides. Nabil Shath says that you and Dennis Ross, quote, defended Israel more than the Israeli delegates did. That's what Shath says. Well, that's Nabil Shath. What can I do? Have you heard that from Saab Let me ask you about... You uh, don't have Saab Arakat's quote on that, do you? I don't think Saab Arakat thinks that the US government has been even-handed, but that's a question for another day. Uh, here's what so many people find so fascinating and frustrating across the world. The United States not only insists on leading this process, but when things go wrong, when Israel, say, violates international law, the US then promptly steps in to protect Israel from criticism, from censure over the past 44 years. I believe the United States has vetoed 42 resolutions at the UN Security Council critical of Israel. In 2011, the US vetoed a Security Council resolution which basically had copied and pasted US policy on settlement expansion into a UN resolution. You vetoed your own policy in order to protect the Israelis. First of all, there are other things in that resolution that, that were unacceptable to the United States and against US policy, and so, so that was a problem. But secondly, the United Nations in general and Security Council in particular are very hostile places to Israel. And so we want to try to keep it out of the UN Security Council, out of the UN General Assembly and try to focus it on a direct negotiation between the parties. Now, there are times when it might be appropriate for UN Security Council uh, resolution. For instance, there's a settlement resolution coming up now. If it doesn't have objectionable uh, things in it, um, I personally would think it wouldn't be a bad thing for the United States at least to abstain on that so that the settlers in Israel understand that it's not cost-free. Abstain. That's as far as you'll go. The whole world is outraged by Israeli settlement that expansion, illegal be. settlements, and the best the US can do is an abstention. That wow. would be huge, Maddie. Yes. It means that the resolution would go through. Do you know how much money the United States gives to Israel every year? Yes, quite how much. Quite well, around somewhere between three and three point five billion. Three dollars. and three point five billion dollars. Have you ever thought about withholding any of that money in order to try and get the Israelis no. to do the right thing? Again, there are two points here. First of all, it's all military assistance, not economic assistance. Israeli economy is, is strong. Which makes you complicit in the occupation, incidentally. Fine, we're complicit in the occupation. We're doing our best to try to end the occupation. Okay, that's that's by what, abstaining. That's what we're about. <laughs> Come on. So, the first point is it's, it's military assistance. So to cut that aid, because we disagree with Israel's policies, is to send a message to Israelis that we're no longer going to be supporting their security. And why is that a problem? It's not just because they face some real threats in the region, but because if they feel that they cannot rely on the United States when it comes to their security, how are we going to get them to take risks for peace? But the US government has withheld money from the Palestinians, but you, you say it should never withhold any money from the Israelis. I'm saying that, that there are consequences for withholding money in the present situation, which would be negative towards the efforts that we're, we're trying to make to achieve peace. I'm not sure how it could be any more negative. Let's go to the panel who are waiting patiently. Uh, Rachel Sharby uh, is an award-winning British journalist of Iraqi Jewish heritage, author of Not the Enemy, Israel's Jews from Arab Lands. Uh, Rachel, as someone who's reported from Jerusalem over several years, followed these issues closely. Do you think the fact that the US is so openly pro-Israel that does or doesn't undermine peace talks? You know, the US um, openly says that Israel is its strategic ally. It likes having a very highly militarized and pro-US ally, Israel, in the region. That's a US foreign policy interest. You talk about um, wanting a peaceful solution, you talk about mediation. Implicitly, there is an assumption of neutrality there that you constantly breach. And even if we're to accept it on the, the terms that you set, which is being pro-Israel, gives you a lever, great, use it. You have consistently failed to use it. You've consistently allowed Israel to be unaccountable, to not uphold international law, to constantly violate pa Palestinian rights. What's the point of having a lever if you don't use it? We have used the leverage. We've used it repeatedly. And that has produced, on repeated occasions, offers from Israel to the Palestinians, which have gone a very long way to meet their needs. 
and nobody else, not the UN, not the EU, not the United Kingdom, has been able to do that. Only the United States has been able to do that. Alan Johnson uh, was a professor of democratic theory before joining BICOM, uh, the Britain-Israel Communications and Research Centre, as a senior research fellow. Alan, other governments come together, as they did in 2011, for example, to try and pass this UN security resolution, basically calling for settlement expansion to stop, which I assume you support. Why can't the United States get behind those efforts? Why can't it use that leverage, in your view? I think there's an assumption behind this discussion, which is that the peace process made has made no progress. In fact, huge progress has been made. Palestinians have recognized Israel. Israel, which used to jail people for speaking to the PLO, has shaken hands on the White House lawn. Mahmoud Abbas was, I think, 30 times in and out of the prime minister's office in Jerusalem. Settlements have doubled. Gaza has been bombed three times. No, I, I, I agree with you. But in terms of the indispensable partner that Israel needs in this process, I think that remains the United States, whatever we think of that. OK, I just want to bring in uh, Garda Kami, British-Palestinian academic, activist, author of Return, a Palestinian memoir. Uh, Garda Kami, what do you say to Martin Indyk when he says, look, the Palestinians need the Americans to be close to the Israelis because you're not going to be able to get a deal out of the Israelis without American involvement? Well, <laughs> all I can say is I've been listening to Martin Indyk very patiently and honestly, I hope you won't be offended if I tell you, I have never heard so much baloney in my life. <laughs> But got to deal with the specific point that Martin right. raised. I mean, quite apart from the partiality that the US has towards Israel, which you've confessed, the very way in which this conflict is viewed is wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. We do not have equal parties. So your talk about we leave it to the two parties is total nonsense. Because what we do have is a dominant, powerful, backed by the biggest and most important state in the world on one side and on the other, an occupied people with no friends and no resources. That's the truth. So why don't you start dealing with reality and show a bit of honesty? I'm sure you're a nice man, okay, let Martin... but it's not coming okay, across. Let Martin deal with that specific point. If the Palestinians do not want the United States as the broker of the negotiations, they are free to go and, and seek any other mediator. Why do they accept the United States as a mediator? Actually, they asked for the UN, to, they've asked for the UN to, be, to be a mediator, and you said it's our interest to take it away from the UN. No. You just said it to me five when minutes ago. When they want to negotiate with Israel, they want the United States in the room. They don't want the United Nations in the room. When they want to impose a settlement on Israel, that's when they go to the United Nations. But the problem with imposing a settlement on Israel is the only one that can impose a settlement on Israel is the one that won't do it, which is the United States. OK, conundrum. Isn't the problem that the United States is this great power and the world sees the United States, you know, you push around the United States, you get punished with all sorts of sanctions, invasion sometimes. Israel never seems to suffer any consequences for whatever it does. John Kerry turns up in Israel in 2014. Uh, the Defence Minister, Moshe Yalon, criticizes his mission as being motivated by a sense of messianism. Uh, Joe Biden goes to Israel in 2010. They humiliate the vice president by announcing 1,600 new settlement units while he's in town. America does nothing. Why does it continue to tolerate uh, basically being slapped in the face by a close ally? Yeah, I, I personally had a problem with all of that. And I think that we do need to make it clear to Israeli ministers on the right who think that they can clip a coupon at America's expense that it's not accepted. How do you make it clear? Well, you know, they don't have to be welcomed in Washington, for example. They don't have to be welcomed in Washington. The Prime Minister of Israel turns up in Congress last year to well, give a speech Prime... denouncing the President of the United States yeah. signature foreign policy achievement. Yeah. Zero consequences. What does he get in return? $40 billion over the next 10 years. That's a good deal. Yeah, and I'm sure that there are, there are people in Israel who say he got away with it. I think that the Prime Minister made a big mistake. I'm on the record many times as saying Should he have to apologise for it? I don't think that that matters. I think he shouldn't have made the speech. He shouldn't have gone behind the president's back. And yet in 2010, uh, you wrote an email, which has now been released as part of Clinton's emails, in which you told her negotiating team that Netanyahu lacks a generosity of spirit and humiliates his Palestinian counterparts. You then, however, advised them, nevertheless, put your arm around Bibi because there's no substitute for working with him, and the purpose of embracing him is to nudge him forward. There's basically no consequences for bad behaviour. You reward bad behaviour. He's really bad. He's self-defeating, I think you called his tactics. But nevertheless, give him a hug. 
Put give, your arm around him. Yes, but it's... No consequences. It's this, you see. That's the theory. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Put your arm around Bibi. So you were really calling for a headlock, not a hug. Is that what you're saying? Close to it, yes. OK, Thank I'm you. just wondering, have you ever asked for Thank the... Thank you for that interpretation. Have you ever asked for the American government to put their, put their arm around the Palestinian president, just having inter- only Israelis yes, get hugged? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because you don't account for the other side of this at all. OK. And neither do you. Well, let me... Let me... Which is that the United States has moved dramatically on the Palestinian issue, from treating it only as a refugee issue and insisting that it be dealt with through Jordan, to recognising Palestinian national rights, recognising a willingness to recognise a Palestinian... No, that's that's not true. We have have worked harder than anybody else. And I apologise to nobody for the efforts that we've made to try to resolve this problem. Just very quickly, I notice in your book, um, you refer to Arafat as, quote, an artful dodger and as a bizarre merchant. I couldn't find you using such disparaging, some might say racial stereotypes, about Israeli leaders in your book in the same way. I'm just... It's your book. I, you know, of course. I'm you said he was a bizarre merchant I out be- to extort a customer in a hurry. No. He your was, words. He, not out to extort a customer in a hurry. But in any case... For the, cu- for the bizarre to... merchant, customers in a hurry are the most vulnerable to extortion. You know, Arafat is exactly what I described there. And another phrase you've used over the years is demographic threat in reference to the growing Palestinian population inside the Green Line. Many Palestinians would say it's dehumanising, it's inflammatory, racist even, to refer to Palestinian babies as a demographic threat. I've never heard that before. I think that, that, that it's a complete misunderstanding of what the reference is to. The demographic threat is the idea that if Israel doesn't find a way to make peace with the Palestinians, it's the Jewish nature of the state and the democratic nature of the state will be in jeopardy. They'll be in conflict because by 2020, 2025, by some counting already, um, Israel will no longer have a majority of Jews in in the Jewish state. You're saying the choice... that's the demographic threat. You've said the choice between being Jewish and being democratic, Israel will have to make that choice. We are at that point, you have said. You've said that Israeli settlements could, quote, drive Israel into an irreversible binational reality, even though you believe there's no other solution apart from the two-state solution. I always hear US officials saying this, the window is closing, the time's running out, um, there's point of no return is being reached. At what stage does it become too late, in your view? I honestly don't know it. What I know is when we get to that point, the two-state solution will be resurrected. It's like the kings and queens of England, you know. The peace process is dead. Long live the peace process. It keeps on coming back. Amazing thing, Mehdi. Amazing thing. Gada Kami, do you agree with Martin Indyk that it it can't be too late because the two-state solution will simply be resurrected when the time is right? There is no possibility of two states for a very simple reason, that the land, the territory that would be needed for a Palestinian state hardly exists. It's full of Israeli settlements. But secondly, without the United States being able to use any kind of pressure on Israel, there will be no two-state solution. There'll be nothing. And the truth is that the US is unable to pressure Israel. It's not unwilling, it's unable. Today, Israel is a one state. It rules another people, it occupies them in one state. But the the problem with that one state is it's an apartheid state. One side has rights, the other has none. So the issue really is not having two states, the issue is converting this apartheid situation into one of equity, and equal democratic rights and no apartheid. That's the thing before us. Okay, let me bring in Alan Johnson, who's shaking his head there. I I just disagree with Garda, not on the basis that the settlements aren't a problem, no disagreement there. The facts, though, if you talk to Settlement Watch, Peace Now, people involved in Israel in this process, they say to you a 6% land swap will bring about 35 of every 40 settlers back into little Israel, proper Israel. That's doable, that kind of land swap. The EU supports it, 
The United States supports it, and crucially, the Arab League now supports it. You asked the question before, when does it become impossible? I'll, I'll, I'll give you my answer. When it becomes politically impossible for Israel to bring back over the number of settlers that are needed in order to make the two-state solution When's possible. I, the reason I don't think we're near there yet, many settlers are economic settlers. They will come back with a compensation and relocation package. The Israeli public itself, when asked before a recent election, if we have to face austerity, what should be top of the list for budget cuts? They said the settlement project. So why hasn't it happened? Mehdi, I think your assumption is that Israel holds peace in the palm of its hand. It just won't Not peace, open it. But it holds the decision to build settlements in the palm of its hand, and it keeps doing it. You do focus on settlements, which is fair, and I agree their problem, but you don't focus on the other side. An Israeli news Which is Palestinian okay. violence, Palestinian terror, Obviously. Palestinian rockets from Gaza. So when I get a, when I get, when I get, figure when in, I get a diplomat from a country narrative. that blindly backs the Palestinians, I promise you I'll ask him that question. Interesting, you keep saying settlements are a problem. A unnamed US official from the peace talks told the Israeli press that the primary sabotage was the settlements. That was widely believed to be you. Was it you? Um, well, that was an unnamed official, so... OK, but you're not denying it's... I'm settlement. sure that unnamed official knew what he was talking about. Good. So, we, so me, you and the unnamed <laughs> official all agree that the primary sabotage was done by the settlements. Rachel Sharby, do you want to come in here? We're talking about people's lives. Every day that you fail, people will die and suffer. So, you know, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a diplomatic spin game that we're Believe trying to win me, here. I know that. OK. I live with that every day. OK, well, that's good to know. Believe me. On the settlements, we have been watching this peace process for a long time. Oslo, Camp David, Annapolis, Washington, um, and then 2014 with you involved again. We all know you didn't discover in 2014 that the settlements are the biggest obstacles to peace. Given that you all know that, and yet you're still reluctant to push that lever, it just creates the impression that for you, the process is more important than the peace, and therefore you are constantly undermining the peace. Well, I think that's, that's a fair criticism. What happened in 2014 was that John Kerry, through a Herculean effort, managed to get the parties back to the negotiating table. Unfortunately, the only way he was able to do that was to work out a deal in which there was nine months of negotiations in exchange for four tranches of prisoner releases. That's what the Palestinians chose. There was a second door, which was a settlement freeze, and they, they didn't insist on that at the time. They went for a prisoner deal. Well, they didn't expect Netanyahu to expand okay, settlements well, every time he released and, a prisoner. And, and but we need which to he did. was on this program, <laughs> and he said that. Yeah. He did it for the prisoners. I know. But the problem was there was no agreement to yeah. stop the settlement. You should tell and that. It was the settlements okay. that screwed up the negotiations. It was, it was the settlements that screwed up the negotiations. You admit that. Okay. It's not an admission. It is a charge. Okay. It was a major problem. Fine. Martin Indyk, you've said in the past that you shared Bill Clinton's view on Middle East peacemaking, that it was better to try and fail than not to try at all. Given you've tried and failed under both Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, uh, do you personally still hold that view? Yes, and I will never give up. It's a Churchillian uh, dictum. Never, ever, ever, ever give up. And, and why? Is because it is better to try and fail than not to try at all. We're going to have to take a break there. In part two, we're going to talk about the US-Israeli relationship and what's behind that relationship. Head-to-head, uh, -head, we'll be back after the break. Welcome back to Head to Head on Al Jazeera English. My guest here in the Oxford Union is Martin Indyk, former US ambassador to Israel. Uh, Martin, there are many competing theories as to why the United States government is so pro-Israel. Uh, some say it's because of shared values. Others say it's due to strategic interest. Others say it's because of the power and influence of pro-Israeli lobbying organizations in Washington, DC. I just want to ask you first about the strategic argument. Uh, General David Petraeus, former director of the CIA, uh, has said that the Israel-Palestine conflict ferments and anti-American sentiment. Uh, even the late Mayor Dagan, who was head of Mossad of Israeli intelligence, has said, quote, Israel is gradually turning from an asset to the United States into a burden. Do you agree with them? No, I, I don't agree with that. I think that Israel 
particularly in its relationship now with Egypt and with Jordan, is working in a common strategic interest to deal with threats in the region beyond the issue of Palestine. But I do believe that making progress on the Palestinian issue enhances America's credibility in the region, and failing to make progress on the Palestinian issue hurts America's credibility in the region. And what about the power and influence of uh, pro-Israeli lobbying organisations in DC like uh, AIPAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which you worked for briefly in the 1980s? Uh, would you say it's all a conspiracy theory? It's all anti-Semitism to talk about the power of uh, lobbying organisations? Or would you say, no, actually, um, they do put a straitjacket on US governments and hinder interests of the US and the region? AIPAC is indeed a powerful lobby on behalf of Israel. There's no doubt that its influence... Uh, constrains what uh, an, an administration uh, can consider that it would do. You said in 2006 the lobby at Congress has put a straitjacket on administrations in a way that has not been productive for American interests. That's me? That is you. No, I don't recognise that. At the quite. London <laughs> Review of Books debate. Okay, you, well, you've also said, and I hope you recognise this one, that you've taken a lot of heat from the Israel lobby and you have the scars to show for it. Correct thereby accepting that the pro-Israeli organisations play a detrimental and powerful role in this process. I didn't say process. detrimental, I think that... Well, if you're working for peace and they're scarring your back, then are they not detrimental? Peacemaking is a blood sport. When you're in the arena, you inevitably face criticism, you know, precisely because I'm seen to have come from the pro-Israel community. There is a, an expectation that all I will do will represent is represent Israel's interests, and my answer is no. I'm there to represent America's interests in making peace, which I happen to believe also serves Israel's interests. But they, some of them, don't agree. Uh, listen to Zev Sternhell, award-winning Israeli intellectual, self-proclaimed super Zionist. He says AIPAC's role is absolutely disastrous because it prevents any possibility to move with the Palestinians. We cannot move without American intervention, but we are more or less free of American intervention. This is AIPAC's job, to give the Israeli government a sentiment of impunity. AIPAC is caught in a kind of bind here because even though, as I say, they represent the pro-Israel community in the United States, they also adhere to the policies of the Israeli government. And as a result, they're caught often in a situation, especially when there's tension or confrontation between an Israeli government, usually a right-wing government, but not always, and, and uh, an American administration. You say they're, they're aligned with Israeli government, but you do accept they don't actually represent American Jewish opinion all that often when it comes to Israel-Palestine, who are much well, more dovish, were, you know, to were, use a phrase. There were 18,000 um, pro-Israelis at the APEC conference. That was a pretty strong uh, expression of, of uh, representation uh, there and then. But yes, there are others in the Jewish community that don't agree with the, the kind of Kool-Aid test that that APAC uh, presents. Okay, and one last question before we go to our panel. Uh, you've been associated with, you've spoken at J Street, which was founded in 2009 as a kind of progressive counterweight uh, to APAC in 2014. The Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations voted not to admit uh, J Street into their umbrella group because in the words of one Orthodox leader, its positions are out of the mainstream of what could be considered acceptable. The conservative American Jewish establishment has shut down progressive Jewish voices on this issue time and again, hasn't it, in the United States? Yeah, and I think they've made a huge mistake in doing so. They've actually boosted J Street dramatically. It's been totally counterproductive. But J Street need, needs to be part of the dialogue. It is. It's made itself part of the dialogue, precisely because they are pro-Israel and pro-peace. And that, that's critically important. It's especially important for a younger generation of, uh, in the American Jewish community who need to be able to, to support Israel in a way that, that makes sense to them. And J Street has a way to reach them in a way that APAC has great difficulty doing. Um, let's go back to our panel. Uh, Garda Kami is a British-Palestinian activist, author, uh, author of a recent memoir, Return. Um, Garda Kami, there's no pro-Palestinian version of APAC. Is that why the Palestinians are not getting their voices heard, in your view, in the US? No, but it's one of the factors. There's no doubt that if there were a uh, Palestinian organisation or pro-Palestinians that was funded so heavily uh, as the other side is, uh, that uh, it would help. 
But I don't believe that that's the central problem here. You have a vicious circle in which Israel rampages around the region, rampages uh, against the Palestinians, and nobody does anything to stop it. Where is Israel rampaging around the region now? Oh, really? So you think being in occupation the of the Syrian Golan Heights, bombing Lebanon, still being in occupation of part of Lebanon, you know, it, bombing you Gaza, brought up Syria you think that's not rampaging? There you had five Israeli prime ministers that was involved in this, all offered the regime of Hafez al-Assad and Bashar al-Assad, full withdrawal from the Golan Heights, all of them. And it comes back to the Palestinians. We had Barak and Olmert offering the Palestinians 95 to 97 percent of the West Bank and all of Gaza, and they didn't take it. Do you know so, what you know, means? there are two sides to every story. Uh, yes. It's not just Israel's yes, fault. Yes, but let me, but please. I'm, I'm glad you've got lots of friends here. But what I wanted to say to you is rather like, you know, you, you, you steal my wallet, which has, let's say, $100 in it, and then I come along and say, let's come to an agreement about this, and you say, fine, I'm going to offer you, I'm going to offer you $60, I'll keep the 40 Now, aren't I generous? <laughs> See, you have more friends than I have in the audience. <laughs> but it's, look, if you cannot be satisfied, it's <laughs> we, fine. We, it's fine. We, I understand we it. Don't but have if anything. you can't be satisfied <laughs> with 95 to 97% of the West Bank <laughs> and all of it? Gaza, then we cannot have a two state solution. Because we don't have time, we can't get into this. But your 95, 97, you know, is questioned by many Israelis, many Palestinians, many I Americans. I was there. Okay. I there was, was there. There were people okay. who were there also who disagreed no, with you. I, um, <laughs> yeah, they happen to be called Palestinians. Look, it, it's easy to make fun of this. I'm not making fun of it. You said you were there. It's I'm there just saying. in terms of what Clinton offered them. Uh, and b both sides tabled reservations to the Clinton parameters in December 2000, as you no, well know. No. Alan, we, Barack accepted them. No, that's not true, but we'll have to agree I, to disagree excuse on Excuse me. <laughs> I was there. Okay. When the facts came from Barack's office to my residence okay. in Israel with the formal decision signed by the Prime Minister accepting the Clinton parameters. So don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, Alan Johnson. Alan Johnson was a professor of democratic theory before joining BICOM, the Britain Israel Communications and Research Centre, as a senior research fellow. Uh, Alan, you work for what's called by some of your critics Britain's pro Israel lobby. Um, surely you wouldn't dispute that groups such as APAC uh, in the United States do exercise a lot of power and influence, and sometimes, many times, in a way that prevents the making of peace in the Middle East. I think it would be ridiculous to say that APAC didn't exercise significant influence. I think, though, it's vastly overstated and the proof of that was that when Barack Obama wanted to drive through the P5 plus one Iran nuclear deal mm. it had no impact. I mean, one other point there's a common sense amongst people which I think is some distance from where APAC is and I think we saw that most clearly with their treatment and reception of Donald Trump at their recent conference. I mean the hooping and the hollering and the cheering of Donald Trump I thought was appalling and for two reasons. One, who Trump is Trump is the most foremost American anti-Muslim bigot. He's a misogynist and he's a xenophobe. And secondly, for who APAC is, which it's, it will be seen by many Jews and many non-Jews as they'll be estranged from the pro-Israel case because they're, they're liberals, they're Democrats, and they have very different values to that. Huge mistake. Rachel Shabi. Um is an award-winning British journalist, Iraqi Jewish heritage, author of Not the Enemy, Israel's Jews uh, from Arab lands. Martin was saying he doesn't think uh, that Israel is a strategic burden to the United States. Many have argued it's an asset in some ways. Where do you stand on that debate now? First of all, just because we're falling into this dynamic of being very uh, uh, partisan and intractable conflict, actually it is perfectly possible to want peace and justice for both Israelis and Palestinians. Please let's not lose sight of that. That position exists. It's perfectly tenable. Um, secondly, I disagree with you, Rada. I don't think that the US is unable to exercise, make Israel exercise restraint. I think it's unwilling to do it because Israel is a strategic asset. You pretend to be about peace and democracy in the region. And, you know, it, it just creates mammoth, mammoth problems. I mean, that is the bit that's problematic. Okay, that is the bit that is seen as hypocritical Martin come back and, and contradictory. The Look, I don't think that 
anybody is under any illusion that the United States is in Israel's corner. We don't hide that. We say it. We shout it from the rooftops. So why does John Kerry say we can be an honest broker then? Well, because the two are not inconsistent. I, I know this is hard. It is very hard, hard to me, accept. I admit, very hard the to two are not inc inconsistent because it's an attempt to try to listen to both sides, figure out what their basic needs are, and come forward with a plan that would be acceptable to both sides. OK, let's go to our audience who've been waiting patiently here in the Oxford Union. Let's take the gentleman in the glasses in the third row. Um, as a human rights lawyer in the past in Israel, I feel that I cannot raise my family in Israel. And indirectly, because of America's support of Israel, Israel is no longer uh, a viable democracy. One that is currently, and over the past five, six years, is constantly in conflict between its Jewish identity and its democratic identity. And while America challenges almost every country in the world in terms of protection of human rights, it does not do that. And human rights organizations are currently under constant threat, and America says nothing about that. Thank you. Well, I think, first of all, that's not true. If you go and look on the State Department website at the latest uh, uh, human rights report uh, on Israel, you will see some pretty harsh criticism of Israeli actions in the West Bank. And if you go back through the years, you will see very harsh criticism. That said, it is a democracy. And it's a shame for Israel that you had to leave, because you need to be there. And all of these NGOs that are under attack there need to be defended. And the United States will stand up for them. And the United States is telling the Israeli government, we will oppose that kind of legislation that some of your Knesset members are trying to pass. But when you say, we don't agree with what you're doing, and they say, who cares, what do you do about it? If you're talking about <laughs> cutting aid, if that's what you're talking about, is, yes, I can imagine that some circumstances would arise. That has happened before, and I don't rule it out that it would happen in the future. Uh, let's go back to our audience. Let's go to the gentleman here in the second row, and then I want to go to the back. My granddad left Palestine to Lebanon in 1947. And so my question to you is, how can you justify denying Palestinians right of return as a precondition to peace whilst abetting settlers to live in Israel? Look, Palestinian refugees need to have a solution to their problem and to their suffering. But it cannot come at the expense of Israel's existence. And so the two have to be reconciled. There is a way of reconciling them. It's in the Clinton parameters to give the Palestinians a right of return to Palestine and a choice about other places where they could go, including Israel. And plus compensation for their suffering. And, and that package of a solution for the, Pal of the Palestinian refugees is going to have to be part of a final status agreement that ends the claims as well as ending the conflict. Okay, let's go back to our audience. Let's go to someone at the back. Uh, my question is, how do you justify uh, thousands of American Jewish like young teenagers join the Israeli army every year? Because I have been paid a visit to Jerusalem and then I met several of them and they are over idealized on this holy war. Sometimes I felt like, how is that different from like the British jihadists over idealized their holy war as well? First of all, uh, American Jews can become Israelis, join the Israel Defense Forces. They have to operate under Israeli Defense Force regulations. And as far as I know, those regulations don't provide for uh, holy jihad. But I think that there are some American Jews who are settlers, who are ideologues. Um, and, and as I said before, that kind of approach, which is designed to take the West Bank because that's the land that God gave to Israel, um, is, a, is, is an approach that is against a two-state solution, and therefore I am against it. Okay, let's go back to the audience. Um, gentleman here in the second row in the suit. As an Israeli, I'm, I feel very uh, privileged to be living at a, at a time 
that the Jewish people for the first time in around 2,000 years do have the ability to defend themselves. So it's understood why it's expected that Israel makes concessions more than others. But from my experience working with peace groups and Palestinians in the West Bank, they have never taken responsibility or agreed that they need to make concessions themselves. Terror have started from the 1920s, before there were any settlements, okay. to this day. What do you think the, con the concessions that the Palestinians need to do, if they even need to do any concessions? Briefly, you know, I think it's, it's not accurate to say the Palestinians have made no concessions. The Palestinian Authority leadership in the PLO have accepted to live side by side with Israel. That is an historic compromise in which they're only claiming, uh, what is it, 40% of, of historic Palestine. 22%. 22%, sorry. Much lower. That's number one. Number two, they've accepted that there should be land swaps. And land swaps would enable Israel to absorb some 75 to 80% of the settlers who live in 6% of the West Bank, provided that Israel provides 6% of Israel proper for the Palestinians. Can we go to the lady right at the back? Yes. I just wanted to ask you, why do you think is it okay for Israel to have a covert nuclear bomb, but not for Iran? And Iran with nuclear weapons threatening to destroy Israel would trigger a nuclear arms race if not an Amer Israeli attack on Iran. And that's why the United Do you United not think States Israel having nukes spent. triggers a, new, a regional arms race? Well, you know, if Israel has nukes... Oh, if? Do they not have nukes? <laughs> if... Does Israel not have nukes? If Israel has nukes, what's interesting... The, I mean, there's a widespread assumption that Israel has nuclear weapons. It has not triggered an arms race in the region. Do it you share not. that assumption the that Egyptians, Israel has nuclear weapons? The Egyptians... I know uh, Israeli Egyptians, policy is not no, to admit to nuclear any weapons. Of You're not an Israeli. Can you tell me if they have nuclear weapons? Oh. <laughs> Enjoy yourself, Mehdi. I'm not going to answer your question. Why? Well, because, you know, it's an issue which I, as a government official, former government official... A US still government advising, official, not Israeli government not official. Why can't the US government say I'm if going, Israel has nukes I'm or not? Opine, opine on it. The issue is whether Israel threatens the region. None of the Arabs around Israel consider that Israel's capabilities present a threat to them. They do consider that Iran's nuclear okay. capability presents a threat. Let's to go them. to this gentleman in the beard. Uh, Israel has broken uh, 65 uh, UN resolutions. Iraq broke two and was invaded, destroyed, and bombed. Uh, why are there such double standards in dealing with countries who violate United Nations resolutions? I seem to be put in this role where I'm supposed to be defending Israel. I'd rather defend the United no, no, States. No, no, I don't think he asked about Israel. He asked about Iraq. America, America invaded Iraq. I think he's making the point <laughs> that the United States invaded Iraq for defying 22 UN resolutions, and oh, Israel has defied lots of resolutions, and it doesn't even get... And, and it, so, an it might get an abstention. If, if and it, so we, if should really bad. <laughs> we should invade Israel. No, not invade, <laughs> but how do you explain the double standards in terms of treatment of countries and international you know, law? Look, the double standards argument is, is, is an argument that is used by Israel and by critics of Israel. So, you know, I, I don't find it's a particularly productive way of, of dealing with the problems. The United States, yes, we have double standards. It's true. We have double standards. We do our best to try to be consistent. But it's not always simple. <laughs> this is, you know, it's simple to, be, to do it at the Oxford Union, but it's not always simple when you're in government when you've got to weigh different interests, one of which is a very important human rights standard. As Americans, that is important. Okay. But Let's... there are a lot of other interests at stake too, and sometimes the balance doesn't come out. It's, it's the province of okay, small Martin... powers to be righteous, okay, you like made... Sweden, for instance. You made the point. Last question, gentleman here in the jacket. I worked as a UN medical officer in Gaza for a couple of years. In 2014, the Wafa rehabilitation hospital four substantial buildings was raised by Israeli attacks with US arms. Now that same year, as you know already, a lot of civilians were killed, again with US arms. Um, three that meant a great deal to our family was a woman who was eight months pregnant and her three-year-old child and six-year-old child. 
Now, those two children were two of over 500 children that were killed during that assault. They were good friends of ours. They are no longer. The family was destroyed. The U.S. continues to arm Israel with state-of-the-art weaponry to the teeth. Can the U.S. justify, in the light of the use of those arms against medical facilities and women and children on the scale that it continues to provide them? First of all, on a, on a personal level, I just say that the, the killing of innocent children is unacceptable by anybody, period. <laughs> I'm not trying to put it as a justification, but I am trying to put it in context that Israeli civilians were coming under attack by Hamas rockets it ended up to be thousands of them. But I'm not presenting it as an excuse, okay? I hope you will understand that. It's not acceptable that children die. But when Hamas hides its rockets in civilian areas, purposely doing so, in order that when Israel comes to try to destroy the rockets, it kills uh, Gazan children. Okay, Martin. That creates a circumstance in which Hamas also needs to take responsibility. One final question. We've run out of time. Uh, you were at the heart of the US-led peace process under both Presidents Clinton and Obama. You've been a special envoy, a senior State Department official, a US ambassador to Israel. Given that process has clearly failed, whatever happens in the future, as of now, has failed. There is no peace, there is no process. Do you feel personally responsible for that failure in any way? Yes. And what can you do about that now? <laughs> what do you want from me, baby? Well, <laughs> okay, all I can no, no. do... Serious note, you all, went back in 2013. I can do... Would you go back again? Until I draw my last breath, I will not give up on trying to resolve this conflict in a way that meets Palestinian legitimate national aspirations to an independent and viable contiguous state living alongside Israel, the Jewish state, in peace. Martin Indyk, on that note, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for coming here to join me on Head to Head and take all these questions. Thanks to our panel for putting some questions and thanks to our audience here in the Oxford Union. That's our show. Thanks for watching Head to Head. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>